All right, folks, welcome and thanks for listening. Jeff Orbitz here. I am happy to be here with you today, and I hope you all having a great day. And uh, I've got a busy program lined up for you. Uh, I, I was going to do a lot more of interview extras today. I'll probably still get to that either later this hour, but definitely in the 5 o'clock hour. But my pile of stuff is just so huge that I want to get to a few items uh, with you, including the latest stimulus package, what's going on in, in Congress on that, what it means to you. Uh, plus, I got some stuff on screen time I want to get to, a, a study that just just blew my mind. So stick around for that. Uh, by, the, by the way, Just Wireless, if you've heard uh, our new spot for them, a great company, uh, my cell phone. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget uh, to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, uh, like the YouTube, uh, you know, the, the movies, the posts, and that really helps me grow the channel. We've got a long way to go, and I'd appreciate you doing that. Uh, my phone was broken and my friends at just wireless were able to fix that for me uh, they have two locations in flagstaff including their milton avenue location where uh it's right there kind of by the the denny's and the um cold stone creamery but they also have their brand new drive through which is right across from the flagstaff mall so you know hey if you don't want to get out of your car now you can drop your devices off your smartphone your tablet uh even your gaming console and then come back and you know pick it up when it's repaired and you can repair these devices save a whole bunch of money so check out check out my friends at just wireless uh and the just wireless listener line we're gonna get to a couple of comments i have a couple of comments actually uh from dan down in Cornville. I'm going to start with those here in just a little bit. 877-971-3971. But I got a, a funny one for you here. Um, you know, I try to give my kids as much of a practical education as possible. Uh, and this can include anything from yesterday. First of all, I, I'm sad to admit that this year I actually had to buy some firewood. Uh, I've had to buy about a quarter and a half because I just, I didn't have the time this year with the show and everything going on with my business and my family and homeschooling and all that. Not that I do much of the homeschooling my wife does, but that means she's busy doing that. And, you know, she just got for Christmas, the uh, best teacher award ever. Uh, of course it was, it was given by Owen and <laughs> she never thought that she would get this, uh, this special award. If you watch the Christmas story over Christmas, uh, vacation and, and, and over the holidays, you know, I got a special special award. She got a, a mug with a plant in, it, plant in it from Owen that she's the number one teacher, which I thought was really cool. And she is. She's doing an excellent job teaching our son. But we've been, anyway, my point here, I'm getting sidetracked. We've been super busy with all kinds of stuff. So I didn't have time to cut wood. Plus they made it difficult for me to get wood, the National Forest Service, by saying, hey, you can only get the permit by calling this number between the hours of 12 and, and or, or eight and noon or something, certain days of the week. And with all the wood out there that needs to be cut, I was like, what is this? And I never had time, never got to it. Um, so next year I'll, I'll do better. So anyway, I try to teach my kids practical jobs because I think we are lacking and even uh, Elon Musk was saying this recently. He was saying we've we've got a lot of people with MBAs and you know these fancy things on the wall, um, but they don't know how to do anything. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So I t try to teach my kids practical practical things: building, uh, how to change a light bulb, how to stack wood. Well, my idea today, and we haven't done it yet, so I'll, I'll report to you tomorrow uh, how this how this goes and how this turns out. Oftentimes. You know, you have to do icky jobs and life's not all sterile and, you know, uh, Netflix and, 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 and screen time and apps about this and that, you know, it's kind of like micro with the dirty jobs. So, you know, especially with, and I'm not being sexist here, um, but especially bathroom sinks <laughs> with women with, with longer hair, which my household, you know, I'm outnumbered. And as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, I, I tend to have shorter hair and, and some missing right up in here. Um, but anyway, um, they, they, it gets clogged, especially with the, the hair when they comb out their hair. And I, I get it. And that's fine. And I, for years, I am fine. The drain slows down. You know, I, I did my stepdad. Uh, he was a plumber. And I spent, I don't know, a good year and a half learning how to do some basic plumbing. I could solder a joint together, run a, run a gas line, uh, even snaking drains. And when you're doing that as a plumber, you run into some very nasty situations that you have to deal with. Plus, as my business as a landlord, uh, there's been many times where I've, I've had to dumpster dive. Well, anyway, one of my kids, and I won't call him out, yesterday, they, I, I asked him to go check 
the garbage, not not a dumpster, just the regular, you know, however many gallon can is at, you know, that you put by the curb at your house. I asked them, hey, I think we threw something out. You're gonna have to go climb in there. And it is like this look of, eh, you want me to, you want me to climb in the dumpster, you know? And I was just like, yeah, go in there. I've dumpster dive before. I mean, I've taken out pieces of furniture. <laughs> Now, I wouldn't recommend that with bed bugs now, but we're talking like rocking chairs and, you know, I find things all the time. In fact, if you're watching on YouTube, I think right behind me, I think one of these plants, <laughs> I shouldn't admit this stuff, was a dumpster dive. I'm not ashamed. I'm, I, I, I'm you know, and I know many of you probably have stories. Um, if it's something good, it's amazing what people throw out. So anyway, there was this squeamishness and I was like, okay, obviously we got to do some, we've got to decrease we've we've got to decrease the squeamishness by increasing the ick factor with with my kids and some are you know i have three kids some are better at this than others so today i decided the drains are going slow we have uh two sinks in the master uh bedroom or bathroom and uh, one sink in the kids bathroom and they're all kind of draining slow so I gave, I'm assigning them, let me know what you think of this. I'm assigning each of the kids, uh, first of all, this is practical. Second of all, I'm just tired of doing it, so I might as well move it on to the, to the, the, the kids, the labor force. Um, I'm assigning each of them a, a drain <laughs> to go ahead and take apart a trap underneath the sink. You know, this is stuff that people, a lot of people call a plumber for. Uh, you know, drain cleaner. And this is something you can easily do. You can put a bucket under there, you know, a little bucket and you, you take, you, you take the trap off. Uh, you might have to take the popper off the, you know, the stop on the sink and get all the gook out of there and maybe run something through it. Like I've, I use a clothesline, uh, and then like, just put a rag on it, just run it through a couple times, drain the water into the five gallon or three gallon bucket and, and voila, it's clean, but it's, it's smelly and it's not a fun thing. So anyway, I will let you know tomorrow how they do cleaning the drain, because I figure one day when they're on their own, um, you know, they'll be able to retrieve that ring that fell down the drain or just quickly fix something uh, that I think they should fix. Anyway, I, I, I wanted to share that with you. We'll see how the ick factor goes. Uh, talking, speaking of ick factor, uh, our wonderful politicians in Washington, D.C., first of all, as you know, the House yesterday, uh, well, President Trump, let's back up a little bit. I talked about this on the program yesterday. On Sunday, President Trump signed the coronavirus $900 billion package along with the omnibus spending, this multi-trillion dollar thing that keeps the government open. He signed it late Sunday. Uh, I'm not too happy that he did it. Uh, I'd love your thoughts on it, though. And one of the things that was in there was the $600 check. You know, Countries like Egypt gets one point something billion dollars. Uh, Sudan gets a bunch of money. Vietnam, Ukraine, you name it. I mean, Ukraine can go buy weapons now. They're probably, you know, uh, how many countries will go buy weapons from Russia? Maybe not Ukraine. They're not best of friends, but I bet you Egypt. And the poor folks of the United States of America, many of which are struggling because of the coronavirus and because of the, quite honestly, stupidity of a lot of our politicians and policymakers, you know, they're sitting back waiting for a $600 check. Well, President Trump said, hey, you should send the American folks $2,000 or maybe $4,000 if you're filing jointly. Well, it passed the House last night, $2,000 for Americans. Uh, they approved it. This is an article from USA Today. Approved $2,000 stimulus checks. Uh, it was a vote that passed 275 to 134. And they needed and they got the support of two thirds of the House, um, you know, to, to, to change this and override the $600 portion. So $2,000 checks. However, it's, I haven't checked. It was heading over to the Senate and the Senate needs 60 votes in order for this thing to go through. Some folks like Marco Rubio and I believe Lindsey Graham have said they were going to jump on board. We shall see if it passes. President Trump is urging the Senate to send the $2,000 uh, $2,000 checks to individuals, $4,000 to family, and I assume there's a kick in there for kids. So a lot of money going out. In fact, the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation estimated that raising the payments to $2,000 per adult would cost nearly $464 billion. And look, I, I said this last week. I, I, well, I don't think we should be doing any stimulus. However, if you're going to vote to send money to Sudan and um, Egypt, what's the other one? There's a lot of them, you know, billions of dollars overseas. And then you're telling the American public, you know, you're doing this. 
you can see this on video if you if you follow me on 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 YouTube if you subscribe to the channel you're telling the you know American public giving them the middle finger in that regard if you voted for that stimulus with 600 bucks you would think that you would have no problem voting for 2000 more i i don't believe in any of this stimulus i i i feel that there are many ways to work with the folks that are most impacted uh the the restaurants the the people who are closed down um the tenants who are facing eviction but also the landlords who still have to pay the mortgage and the property taxes you know, you deal with all those people. You help those people who are in most need. There are a lot of people out there who are in a position like, you're going to send me two grand. Okay, I'm going to take the money, the quote unquote, I'm doing big air quotes right now. The quote unquote free money. You're going to give me money, which it ain't free. We know that. But you're going to give me money. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take your two grand, four grand, five grand, whatever it is. And a lot of people are just putting it in the bank. We know there are better solutions for this. These stimulus packages are really bailing out the states that refuse to reopen back up. And this is just the beginning. So this passes, then Biden gets in there. Um, where are we at? We're, we're the 29th. We're heading to January 20th for the, the, the swearing in. Uh, they're going to do this again. Now, something else they included in this um, stimulus package that passed last week, both houses and that President Trump signed, is the extension, and I pulled this straight from the 5,000 plus page uh, $900 billion stimulus and omnibus package. Uh, this was on page 2,281. Yeah, that, I had, <laughs> that was fun to find, believe me. Because you got to get through all the, you know, money to Ukraine, uh, money to uh, Sudan and all that and actually find this thing. Did I forget one? Was it gender studies in Pakistan or something like that? But anyway, the eviction moratorium, for those of you who are in a situation where you're having trouble paying your rent, or for those of you who may be landlords who maybe are having trouble paying your mortgage and your property taxes and your insurance and the upkeep, and you know if you're fully rented, you might make $200 on this duplex that you have that you invested in and you're hoping to get a good return and maybe that's your retirement. If you're a little concerned, you should be because they have extended the eviction moratorium. Here's straight from this bill. The order issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention under Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act. Uh, this is something like from 1944 or something entitled Temporary Halt in Residential Evictions to Prevent the Further Spread of COVID-19. Regulation 55292. September 4th, 2020 is when it was issued. It's extended through January 31st, 2021, notwithstanding the effects dates specified in such order. So uh, what President Trump did and what the Republicans and the Democrats did in the House and the Senate was they extended this eviction moratorium, uh, which is a really troubling thing for a lot of landlords. And full disclosure, I am in that business. And I can tell you, it, it's been an interesting year. Um, many tenants pay their rent and they want to pay their rent and it's a matter of pride and they're going to work and do everything they can. There's some that are in a situation where COVID has hit them, whether it be economically or, you know, physically for real. And I get that. And most landlords are working with people. However, there are many people that take advantage of these types of situations. So then I read this article from another one from USA Today, a beacon of, I'm not even going to say it. Uh, landlords skirt COVID-19 eviction bans using intimidation and tricks to boot tenants. And this article goes on for 14 pages here that I've printed out, basically about how landlords are unscrupulous and taking advantage of tenants. And it goes on and on. It is totally biased. And I believe me, there are landlords out there that, that do that and that aren't good landlords. You know, we know that there's good actors and bad actors all over the place. But it just goes on story after story from, from tenants that are in tough situations. And I get it. A lot of tenants are in tough situations. But I know plenty of people that have a duplex or something, like I said, or one home, one rental, and they're drowning and, and they're facing uh, you know, foreclosure and they're behind on their mortgage payments, their tax payments, uh, their insurance payments. Uh, they can't put the money in for repairs. 
And there's no love loss here in society for the folks who provide housing. So I guess everybody just wants the government maybe to provide the housing going forward. On that note, let's come back with, um, I've got a comment here that I found very good and very timely uh, from Dan from, um, from, let me get this right, Cornville. And he chimed in on the Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. Regarding my interview that we re-aired yesterday with Mayor Paul Deasy regarding the housing crisis, stick around for that, folks. Hang tight. Back in a minute. All right, folks, welcome back. And I'd love to hear from you. Chime in on the Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. I want to make it clear, I'm not making light on the situation that many millions of Americans are faced with as far as uh, potential for eviction and so on and so forth. But I guess what I'm trying to stress here is that the the government's not going to fix this. They're not going to make it better. And uh, it's just, it's not the road to go down. In in fact, I think they're going to make it worse in the long run, especially with the debt numbers and the budget problems and so much more. Um, I just wanted to drive that point home. And, you know, I'm in the rental business now, but I haven't always been in that situation. I've been on the other end of it where I've rented a place and there were were times where I ran into a bad situation and, uh, you know, was short on the rents. So I I get it. But it. This eviction moratorium when there, there's just this attitude that the other end of the equation here, which is the people that own the properties, um, are, are starting to have a lot of problems, some of them. And you've got to address that situation. Now, the government's solution is, oh, we're just we're going to send checks out to every American, you know, it makes under 150 or whatever the number they came up with. Um, and we're going to send the states a bunch of, um, you know, uh, help, aid money, basically, to help uh, prevent the evictions. And to help people in this situation and that situation. Problem is, you know, they're so overwhelmed, these local agencies that flow through the counties, that they're having trouble um, facilitating all the requests. I know because I've had a tenant or two that's called me and said, hey, I can't get through. And we're like, okay, we'll work with you. Let's, let's, let's keep trying. And, um, you know, you, you keep talking to these folks. I understand your situation. But a lot of people just give up or they don't even try. Uh, so it's not really a solution. But There's a bigger problem that's developing, and we're seeing it in communities, especially rural communities uh, around America, but let's just focus here in northern Arizona, especially Flagstaff, Sedona to a degree, Um, and if you're in the Sedona area, I'd love to hear from you. Prescott area has gotten more and more expensive. Uh, More and more people are moving to these locations because they want to get out of, um, they want to get out of the cities. They want to get out of these areas that can lock down and force people to stay in their apartments. Uh, the crime, uh, think about uh, what up in, would you want to live in Portland? Anyone in their right mind want to live in Portland or anywhere in uh, in California, um, in LA, where you're told you can't even go outside and walk? So people are fleeing to, believe me, I get calls every day. Uh, I'd say, I'd estimate right now, my calls for rentals are about one third are not from Arizona anymore or Flagstaff or Northern Arizona. They're from out of state. And many of those are from California. I just signed a lease with someone uh, yesterday who is actually moving from out of LA and moving back to Arizona where they have family. Um, they had their, they didn't even see the place. They had their family come look at it and prove it and say, yeah, we, we, we want it. Uh, so you're, you're getting that situation more and more, but anyway, um, let's uh, go to, let me put my headset on. And if you're watching on, um, YouTube. You can subscribe to the channel, please. And you can get to YouTube by clicking on my link on talkwithjeff.com. It's right on the top of the page, right side, uh, YouTube, and says subscribe or something like that. And I'd appreciate it if you do that. Uh, so I had a couple of comments here from, from Dan from Cornville. Let's go ahead and cue that up. And I have a message for Mayor Paul Deasy about housing affordability and Flagstaff. He uh, seems to have a lot of ideas on how to look at this from so many different angles, but why don't he just look around the country at other cities who have been successful in reducing property values? Take, for instance, San Francisco. Um, they've, uh, their policies have uh, created the environment where many wealthy people have left the city and property values are plummeting. I think that would solve the uh, the housing affordability issue in Flagstaff. Yeah, 
No, that's a good comment. And folks, you can, you can chime in on the Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. Yeah, but they sure are dealing with that housing problem. Um, we're seeing a decrease in some of what I'm hearing. The people I talk to in especially the LA area, and I talk to some people back in New York, I see some articles about Manhattan real estate. The plus side to all this, I guess, is that the rent rates and the values are in, in some cases, I'm hearing coming down because people are fleeing. So it's a supply and demand issue. But uh, I yeah, I wouldn't recommend going to California. Uh, you want to start a business in California. You want to work for a business that, you know, might relocate like many are. They're relocating to Arizona and mostly Texas and places like that. Uh, but yeah, that certainly will solve the problem, right? Uh, but is it going to be harder? Let me throw this out at you. Is it going to be, is the rental crisis the the housing crisis, and Dan's referring to the interview we replayed, by the way, yesterday with now mayor of Flagstaff, Paul Deasy. And we we spent a lot of time on that, the quote unquote housing crisis and quote unquote solutions. (laughs) How's the government going to fix it? Which I know they can't. Uh, In Flagstaff, they've talked about fixing the housing problem for 50 years. So they're never going to fix the housing problem. It's not something that government can solve. They can make it worse and they probably will uh, with certain policies. There's things they could do to relieve some of the pressure. But I was talking to a buddy of mine just maybe it was yesterday, a uh, contractor. And uh, he's like, I, I need this $2,000. I have to put a plug. Get this. This makes sense. You want, you want houses to be more affordable. What do you do? you create a situation where it costs more money. So what the government of Flagstaff did is they said that every new garage that's built, so you're building a new house, or I guess if you're doing a standalone garage, probably, if you're building a garage, you have to put a EV, an electric vehicle plug in the garage. And I've had estimates that this is around two grand or so in extra wiring and the, 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 you know, the breakers and the connection and whatever. Uh, it's great. If you have an electric vehicle, (laughs) which I drive around, you drive around, uh, if you were to stop, you know this, you're just, most of us have common sense, except for most of the politicians. Um, If you were to stop and look at most cars that are driving by you, I would have to gander that, (laughs) gander a guess here, that the super vast majority of those cars uh, are not electric vehicles and they probably won't be for some time i'm not going to say that we're never going to we're not ever going to be at the point where we have a lot more electric vehicles on the road i think they will and i think there's probably some advantages for you know shorter term travel and things like that and maybe it's going to get better and better um you know there's there's, i I wouldn't mind having a cool ev at some point but i should be able to decide that i want to put this plug in my garage because i'm going to have an electric vehicle so anyway just one example of how government is making housing more expensive and that is a requirement for a plug that you are never going to use. You're just, you're not going to use it. So $2,000 more. So they, there's a lot of things they can do to harm it. There's some things they can do to make it less expensive. Um, but the reality is they're not going to do that. Um, what's happening in San Francisco, uh, and I know Dan, you're being tongue in cheek there a lot too. Uh, it's, just, it's just not going to have here. Anyway, part two from Dan here on our Just Wireless listener line. Eight seven seven nine seven one three nine seven one. Chime in any time. I hear a lot of talk about housing affordability in Flagstaff, and the uh, city is considering passing an ordinance to restrict the height of buildings. But if they do that, then they are going to be liable for the reduced value of the properties to the property owners. And there's hundreds of properties that will be affected by that. Well, along those lines, wouldn't restaurants and businesses that have been shut down by order of the mayor and council be able to take the same recourse? Um, I'd like to see a class action lawsuit of uh, the businesses of Flagstaff against the city of Flagstaff for reduction in the value of their businesses because of the lockdown ordinances and laws that they have passed. Yeah, great, great comment. It's a a taking. And um, let me go back to this eviction moratorium, which I have called from the beginning, and then I'll get back to your restaurant and business closure. Great, great comments 
uh, Dan uh, from Cornville. Two two great comments. And remember, you can chime in anytime. The Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. But great comments here. But I go back to the eviction moratorium and I see article after article that Oh yeah, there's an eviction moratorium, but it's not a it's not a rental moratorium. It's not a you know a, a ban or not a ban. It's not a uh, a stay on paying your your rent. Uh, it's not rent forgiveness. What whatever however they word it, they always say these geniuses in the media and the politicians that write this stuff. They always say, well, it's still due in full. <laughs> and anyone who's ever been in the rental business um, would know that if. Generally speaking, and I speak from a pretty big wealth of experience here, if somebody owes you in a rental situation $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, whatever it is, the probability of you ever getting that back rent and getting paid is, it's very, very slim. It's very slim. I I speak from hundreds of examples and um, let's just put it, the six figures that um, I will glad, hey, Go ahead and chime in right now if you want to. If you want to buy my book of rent that I'm going <laughs> to collect, and I'm not being a whiny landlord here or anything. I've written it off. I get it. But if you want, I ten cents on the dollar. Uh, I, I, I hey, actually, <laughs> let's do this. I would encourage a politician that wrote. Uh, where did we put this? The rental. I'm holding it up for my YouTube viewers. The rental uh, moratorium. You barely see that. For those of you who wrote this. Uh, I have a great investment for you. I I will give you the book of past due rent <laughs> that dates back I mean ten years now. Uh, you can have it for ten cents on the dollar. Uh, actually, just send me a check for five grand and I'll give it, I'll give it all to you. Much less than ten cents on the dollar. No, but the reality is it's hard to collect all of this stuff. So it, to me, it's a it's an illegal taking. But good luck taking that to court, uh, Dan. Uh, same thing with the restaurants. You ordered them to close. But then at the same time, remember we dealt with this last year, you also required them to continue paying their property taxes, their insurance, uh, you know, any kind of fees and stuff to the city, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure they still had to pay on all of that. I'm sure the restaurants still had to do their twice a year, uh, their, their twice a year oven hood inspection through the fire department. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they, they uh, let them forgo that while they were closed. Uh, but you know, the, the requirement went from once a year to twice a year. Uh, so I'm sure they still had to pay that fee, right? They still wanted their money, but they didn't want to help them out really. Uh, hey, if you have a hair salon that was closed down, you probably are required by the city of Flagstaff, for example, and I bet you most cities are like this. You're probably still required to have your annual backflow prevention check, which is a cost, even though you weren't using the facility. So anyway, my point being is, yeah, I think these are all legal takings. Does anyone care? I mean, does anyone care about the national debt either or anything like that? Nobody cares anymore. I care. You care, Dan. Uh, but is anybody going to do anything about it? I don't know. I'd love your thoughts, folks. Go ahead and chime in on the Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. I'm going to keep going here. I got another pile that I want to get to. Um, Something coming up next that really disturbed me the other night, and it has to do with well, it has to do with, I'll use the word zombies, uh, but it's, it's not actually zombies, folks. I want you to stick around for that. Hang tight. Back in a minute. All right, folks, welcome back. Jeff Horvitz here, and I'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and chime in on the Just Wireless listener line, 877-971-3971. Great company there, and they've got their drive through location in East Flagstaff, right across from the Flagstaff Mall. You can, just, you can drop off your smartphone, your tablet, your computer. Um, not computer, your gaming console. Let me get that straight. And uh, they will take care of it just like they did. They fixed my phone in no time. My iPhone didn't have to buy a very new expensive one. So go ahead and stop by there. Plus chime in anytime, 877-971-3971. And and by the way, thank you to James from Cottonwood. He left me a a comment that made me laugh. uh, And it had to do with the reason why. I'm just going to sum it up, James, because... That's what I want to do with this one. The reason why, you know, the politicians do so many dumb things is they have a microchip inserted from Google. I'm just kidding. We're on YouTube and I don't want, I don't want to get banned there for saying that, uh, but they just kind of nod their heads. Let's, let's just go with that. And, uh, and they're just, they're being controlled. I, I don't know. It, we aren't too far from 
the microchip, I guess, and eventually people will just will just accept some kind of chip to enhance their uh, their screen time or whatever. And I've got something with screen zombies coming up here in just a second uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, but thank you, uh, James from Cottonwood, for that comment. Hey, by the way, there's a couple ways. There's many ways that you can watch or listen to the show. You know, we're expanding on YouTube. And uh, if you want to get me a late Christmas present, by the way, I never even talked to you about Christmas. I had a wonderful Christmas. I mentioned it real quick yesterday, but uh, an awesome time with my family, and uh, and it was just it was just wonderful. So I I, I hope all of you did as well. Um, but if you want to get me a late Christmas present, uh, please go go to talkwithjeff.com. And what you can do is right on the top of the page, on the right side, the top banner, uh, there's a YouTube button that'll take you. Uh, that take you to a link will take you directly to my YouTube channel. You can hit subscribe. Please hit subscribe. Uh, help me out. Help me grow this channel. And, and so we can reach more and more people as we continue to expand uh, the video and the quality and, and keep working on that. So please do that. Go to talkwithjeff.com, click on subscribe, and follow the link, and then just click on subscribe when you get to the actual YouTube channel. But don't spend too much time on YouTube, uh, because this this article kind of disturbed me the other night. Um, I I have probably upped my screen consumption. You know the time that I spend on screen on the devices, uh, whether it be my my iPhone or whether it be I have a laptop right over here that you can't see. Um, I you know we have there's screens all over the place, and uh, I've. <sighs> I'm guilty. So I'm not going to be preachy here because, you know, I've talked a lot about screen time over the years. I'm not being preachy. I'm more saying this um, because I want to try to I want to try to help myself and reduce the amount of screen time. Uh, So as I was flipping through my iPhone the other day, looking for some ideas for the show this week, because I was, you know, it's kind of a light week, although here we are, I'm I'm still chatting with you um, when I said we're going to just do some interview extras. But I'm sitting there, you know, I've got the TV on. And maybe I was watching Netflix or Amazon, you know, Prime or whatever. And I'm also scrolling through my phone at the same time. I'm like, geez, this is too much. So I come across an article while I'm doing that entitled Screen Zombies. And this is from a site that I go to a lot, studyfinds.org. Great site. Uh, They have a lot of government studies. They have a lot of uh, companies that put out studies. And this particular one is from an eye company because, you know, the more you look at these screens, the more eye problems they say that you're going to have. They're claiming, according to this study, that the average person will spend 44 years, (laughs) wow, 44 years looking at digital devices. And that was before, before COVID, which you know, it's gone up. You know it. I mean, you had politicians telling uh, you, even in Arizona, you had Governor Ducey saying, hey, stay at home, <laughs> watch Netflix, right? So anyway, this survey says that the average American will spend the equivalent of 44 years, 44 years uh, on some kind of digital screen. Uh, it's, it's a poll of 2000 adults commissioned by Vision Direct looked at the average amount of time spent on various devices throughout each day. Uh, The results reveal that the typical American spends, get this, four hours and 30 minutes watching TV, four hours and 33 minutes looking at the smartphone, and over three hours, yes, all right, over three hours using a gaming device and nearly five hours on a laptop. That adds up to about 17 hours per day. Now, when I read that, I was like, wait a second. 17 hours per day. I mean, that just doesn't sound realistic considering last I checked here on earth, <laughs> there's 24 hours in the day, right? And it's like, okay, so you're telling me these people are doing 17 hours and they're sleeping, uh, you know, seven hours. What are, I mean, that just doesn't compute to me. That this can't be every waking hour. But then I started thinking about my situation where I found this article, which was I had something playing and I do this a lot. I'll actually, this can actually be maybe a positive, maybe a negative, depending how you look at it. I got something playing a movie in the background, maybe one I've seen before. That's just like kind of a distraction. Okay. I just want to sit down and I don't want to be at my office desk, but I'm also doing work. So let's just say we go with this number of four, four and a half hours of screen time a day watching TV, but people are also scrolling through their device. Now, I was being productive. And again, I'm not being preachy here. I, I feel I was being productive. But was it really productive? Because I was my attention was 
split between some movie that was probably lame versus and, and you know what I was looking up. But how many people are just scrolling through their Facebook feed or you know Twitter feed or Instagram feed or whatever the heck you're on nowadays, Parlor, while they got a movie going and they're just blah blah blah, blah or they're looking up some pointless fact. So I think that probably accounts for a lot of the. Uh, extra time there. But the bottom line is, even if you don't believe this 17 hour figure, if you think about your daily routine and again, not being preachy here, I think about my daily routine and I'm like, geez, I got to cut down on the amount of screen time. I mean, right now this counts as screen time. I've got, I've got three screens right around me just that are on right now. Four, if you count this iPhone. So I'm like, I got to cut this down. So I started thinking about, um, all the time that, that, that this is probably true, all the time that I spend outside, and I've said this for years, you know, I may be working in a yard or I may be in a garage, which I guess technically isn't outside, but the door's open, so I, I consider it outside this time of year because I'm freezing in there. And I don't see people out. I don't see kids out and about on their bikes or, you know, playing. My, my kids tend to spend a lot of time outside. I'd like them to spend even more but I think it's pretty clear that people are spending more and more time. So even if you don't believe the 17 hour thing a day, my point being here, we know it's, we know it's obscene. We know that we've got to cut back. So anyway, this thing is going on. Um, it, it also says that even during people's break, so, you know, a break from work and they're, they're referring to their remote break. Uh, you know, you're taking a break, whatever, maybe you're doing online schooling or whatever, you know, it's something like that. That even during their break, more than half of the poll respondents spend their remote working breaks browsing through Facebook. So even on a break. And another 42%, they head over to YouTube and four in 10 Americans hop onto Twitter during the break. And by the way, go to YouTube and subscribe to my channel. Just don't watch it too much. You know, just just be a little more selective. So yeah, even during these breaks uh, from from maybe screen time, from online stuff, from your Zoom meeting, then you take a break by scrolling through your feeds and stuff like that. And they're saying it's having an impact on eyes uh, and and stuff like that. Uh, One more thing here that the survey found. The survey finds that it takes less than 10 minutes for the average American American to go from waking up to looking at a screen each morning. And I have some solutions here coming up in just, just a minute as to how to maybe cut back on that a little bit. Of course, they're attributing poor eyesight Uh, to the screen time. Uh, Six in 10 adults find themselves arguing with their partner over their digital addiction. Three in four parents, and how many of you have done this? And, And I've probably done this as well. Three in four parents feel hypocritical after yelling at their kids about staring at the screen too long, uh, on their digital device. So it's like, you know, do as I do, as I, uh, say, not as I do. So anyway, I, I was thinking about the consequences of all this, this sc- screen time. And first of all, the look, these devices can be wonderful, wonderful things, right? They can, they can be, you know, you can save so much time. You can work remotely. Look, imagine if we didn't have these things right now and a lot of us, a lot of people are isolated. Maybe they're not seeing grandma or grandpa, you know. Uh, because they have pre-existing conditions and you don't want to go around them. And I get that. So there's a lot of pluses here, but I guess the old saying everything in, in moderation. And I have to practice this as well. You know, I, I have had this policy of mine for a long time that I don't want to have uh, any, and I'm going to open up my device while we're doing this. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, this counts as double time. I've got one screen, two screens, three screens open. So this counts as double time for my screen time. But my policy is, and I've preached to you quite a bit, and I haven't done so in the past six months, is not, to, okay, let me back up. I, it's been 12 months, not to have social media apps on your phone. And those of you watching, I don't know if you can really see that, there's my Facebook app. It's on my phone. I put it back about a year ago when we switched to doing more podcasts and things like that. And I'm once again, my new, I don't do really do New Year's resolutions, but I will do this one. I'm going to take the social media apps off my phone. Uh, so that would be my number one advice that again, you can say that I'm, uh, not doing as I, <laughs> doing as I say, like, like the survey said, uh, you know, the parents that tell their, their kids not to do it and then they go do it. Um, but I'm going to take those social media apps off my phone once again and, and try to get back on the wagon or is it off the wagon, whatever, whatever the case may be. But anyway, I was thinking about the consequences of 
all of the screen time and I started thinking about the productivity and the lack of productivity. And it just, I started thinking about all the things that we aren't doing that we used to do, like create creatively. If, if you don't have these devices, when you're scrolling through them while you're sitting there on the couch in the morning or whenever, your mind never clears up. And I know this because when I sit there and scroll through it, you're like 20 minutes have gone by and whoa, what did I do? You know, what have I done? Nothing. And I looked up a bunch of useless facts. So I really wonder what this means going forward for the product productivity, inventing things, creating things, you know, writing a book, whatever it may be. And all those missed opportunities we're having because we're obsessing over these things and we're just on them uh, way too much. Adults, kids alike. So I got a couple things. I mean, I, I'm going to try. I'm aspiring to do this. Um, I mean, if you really wanted to take it to, I don't know if you'd call it the extreme, you ditch the smartphone and just get a flip top or something or landline. I know most of us aren't going to do that. It's not practical, but at a minimum, ditching the apps, especially uh, the social media apps. Uh, number two, and I'm, this is, these are the two things I'm trying this year. You can, you can try them or not. It's just I'm sharing what I'm trying to do. It's on a TV. You know, we don't have cable in my house anymore, but we have more channels than ever before because we have Netflix, we have Apple TV, we have Amazon, uh, CBS, this and that. There's so many choices. I feel I get stressed because you're sitting there scrolling through the t- TV apps. And then trying to find something. So I'm like, now when I go to the TV, I'm like, I got a plan. I'm watching this. I decide before I go for now and because you just get so, uh, I don't know if you're like me, I get burnt out scrolling through all the choices. I'm like, oh my God, 20 minutes have gone by and I still <laughs> haven't found something. And maybe I've just run out of stuff to watch. I don't know. And I guess with the amount of hours, supposedly 44 years we're spending watching these devices, maybe we've just run out of stuff to watch and that's why I'm scrolling so much. But anyway, folks, I wanted to share that with you and um, I'm going to cut down. That's my plan this year. Cut down on the screen time as much as possible. And uh, hopefully my kids will see that and then they'll, they'll go outside more and, and do stuff more and stuff like that. Anyway, folks, love your comments. The Just Wireless listener lines open just for you. 877-971-3971. All right. I went on for a full hour. I wasn't going to do it. I was going to play some interview extras, but I, I wanted to clear my desk and we didn't even get through everything. So I'll bring that back tomorrow. Plus any comments you make today, I will get on tomorrow's program. Once again, 877-971-3971. But don't go anywhere coming up. Uh, if you're going to stick around on the big talker, um, I want you to stick around because I've got a great interview extra. You may have missed this one. Another mayor here in Northern Arizona. This one, he has a different approach than, for example, the Flagstaff mayor, um, Mayor John Moore of Williams. We will have an interview extra with him. All right, folks, hang tight. And don't forget, hey, don't forget, go to my YouTube channel, subscribe to that. Go to talkwithjeff.com. You can get all the links. Plus, send me an email and chime in anytime. All right, folks, hang tight. Back in a minute. You're listening to The Jeff Orovitz Show. 